This episode is brought to you by That Gosh Darn Hippie Show. Featuring music from the days of vinyl, it's the grooviest thing to hear on your radio. If it's at all possible, musicals have an even uneasier relationship with history than other forms of fiction. On the one hand, history is amazing, full of interesting times and extraordinary events, just ripe with drama, lush costumes, and fascinating characters that will probably look pretty cool singing a power ballad. But on the other hand, history is messy. It's full of complications and contradictions, and seldom adheres to such storytelling niceties as a linear plot or easily delineated boundaries between good guys and bad guys. Which is why producers of historic fiction like to tidy things up a bit, especially if that producer is Disney, which likes everything to be as tidy and marketable as possible. To illustrate, let's have a look at the story behind Newsies, the New York City newsboy strike of 1899. It seems odd that a corporate behemoth like the mouse would endorse a story advocating for collective bargaining rights, but Disney has always loved its scrappy underdogs, especially if they can be poor in a colorful and not-too-squalid manner. And while they didn't exactly fit the not-too-squalid part, 19th century newsboys were certainly colorful, with names like Kid Blink and Major Butts. Throw in some choreography and a few Alan Menken songs, and even child labor can look absolutely cheerful. So here's how it originally went down. The roots of the 1899 strike go back a couple of years earlier to the Spanish-American War. See, newsboys would buy papers from the publishers at 50 cents for a bundle of 100. When sold for a penny a paper, this gave them a 50 cent profit, assuming they sold the whole bundle, a task that might have them working well into the night. During the war, many publishers raised their bundle price to 60 cents, at the time not a major issue, as the war also increased demand for papers, compensating for the increased overhead. After the war ended, most publishers went back to the pre-war prices, with the exception of two, Joseph Pulitzer's Evening World and William Randolph Hearst's New York Evening Journal. Newsboys protested the continued rate hike with a boycott that began on July 18, 1899, with a group of boys overturning a journal delivery van. This action was a piece with the early phase of the strike, which was chaotic and even violent, with strikers frequently attacking those who crossed picket lines. Then on July 24th, a rally in support of the strike was held at Irving Hall, during which Union President David Simmons formally read the strikers' resolutions and also urged nonviolent methods of protest. This was the high point of the strike, but it didn't last long. Two days later, on July 26th, Simmons and fellow strike leader Kid Blink were accused of taking bribes from the boycotted papers. Though both denied the charges and stepped down from union leadership to mitigate the scandal, the damage was done and the strike lost momentum. On August 1st, a compromise was proposed. The bundle cost would remain at 60 cents, but publishers agreed to buy back any unsold papers, reducing the risk of newsboys being forced to work at a loss. The union agreed, and the strike ended the following day. While the concept of the newsboy strike is captivating, the facts don't really fit into a conventional narrative arc. The inciting incident, the increase in newspaper pricing, occurred well before the strike itself, and the resolution is rather anticlimactic. From that perspective, it makes sense that the writers would tweak things to tell a better story. Events are compressed, Hearst is left out of the affair making Pulitzer the sole antagonist, and the assorted strike leaders are rolled into the original character of Jack Kelly. Jack's presence also allowed them to introduce a more sympathetic element into the climax, where the hero is torn between loyalty to their friends and cause and the temptation of a deal with the devil. Simply accepting a bribe to cross picket lines isn't likely to endear you to an audience, but a dream of leaving behind your life for adventure in a new place? Well, that's the stuff Disney I Want songs are made of. Newsies also takes broad liberties to introduce a female element into its story, though surprisingly it didn't have to. Girls and women also worked as paper hawkers, though many did not participate in the strike as the gender norms of the time protected them from most of the retaliations that were visited upon male scabs. A notable exception was one Annie Kelly, who sided with strikers and became an important figurehead to them. Such was the effect of Kelly's moral integrity and popularity that her profits went up during the strike, despite not selling two of the most popular papers. 
I would have liked Newsies to have included Annie Kelly's story, rather than introducing random side characters or giving Pulitzer an intrepid gal reporter of a daughter. But hey, musicals need love interests even more than they need starry-eyed kids with their eyes on the horizon. Boss gets away, gonna roll it over him, roll it over him, roll it over him. Boss gets away, gonna roll it over him, gonna roll the union on. Gonna roll, we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll the union on.